apathy, the apathy of God. There was a question on the 909 Prime Zone Facebook page, and there was a question in the box. And uh, I didn't mean to derail everybody uh, about with that particular concept. Um, the, the overall concept is what's called the impassibility of God. That is, God cannot suffer. And it goes all the way back to Greek philosophical religion. And the early Christians, and, and this is very simplistic and cond a condensed sense of history, the earliest Christians had a hard time, it seems to me, extracting or differentiating in their own minds Greek philosophical religion and Christian categories that flow naturally from scripture. And so even people like Augustine uh, would talk about uh, God's inability to suffer or God's inability to, to feel in, in a way that humans feel. Uh, and so the apathy is connected to this because if you, if you have emotions, then you're capable of suffering. You, you can't feel emotions without feeling rejection, feeling, you know, bad things as well as good things. And uh, Daniel McGlory, in his book, uh, Faith Seeking Understanding, he suggests that the way we should understand this is that God is not controlled by human emotions. But, you know, how can we say God has no emotions when, if scripture is revelation, scripture says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And that's just, that, that's just one example. Uh, and so the concept that uh, Daniel McGlory wants to emphasize is that God is not, not controlled by them. A, another possible category under which we might uh, put apathy is the concept of anthropomorphism which is the attributing of human characteristics and behavior to anything that's not human, including God. And there is a tendency to anthropomorphize God. And the Bible anthropomorphizes God. Uh, God walks in the garden in the book of Genesis, in the, in the story of creation. And I, I would maintain that I don't, I don't even think the, the writers, uh, compilers of, of Genesis at the time meant that that would be literal. The point in the Old Testament is that God is active within creation. He's not aloof. And so there are all kinds of ways that, that the Old Testament uh, communicates that, that belief that God is active and involved within creation, but is not, uh, he's not the same as his creation, he's not controlled by his creation. And that may bring us back to where we left off. I don't know how to explain it any better than that. I don't want you to get distressed about it. Uh, God's, I believe that God certainly feels, and I think that be, certainly since Jesus, and the incarnation, God uh, exposes himself to risk. God exposes himself to the things that humans experience. And he does so willingly and freely, but he is still not controlled by uh, those, for example, the sense of rejection. God, despite what many Christians may say, I do not believe that God smites people because he feels you made me mad, so, you know, I'm going to wipe you out. I don't believe God does that. So, creation. We, were, we left off, I was talking about how in creation, this, the doctrine of creation is like a suitcase, and that one of the things in the suitcase is 
ex nihilo, which means uh, out of nothing. This concept, this, this idea about God actually developed in the second century in response to our good old friend Gnosticism. Gnosticism is, you know, I would suggest you go Google it because it's very, it's complex. There isn't like one flavor of Gnosticism. It's a extremely complex and varying uh, varying ways of thinking about, about God that are not biblical. But one of the common threads in it was, well, actually two things. The first is a separation of the material from the spiritual. Uh, the material is evil and corrupt. The material is good, or excuse me, spiritual is good. And the, the goal, if you will, of religion or God is to help us escape from this evil, wicked world to get to some idea of spiritual, a spiritual world, whatever that idea might be. Corresponding with that came a belief that there are two gods depicted in the, in the Bible. The Old Testament God is the creator of this world, and because the world is material and evil, this God is lesser, depending on which Gnostic you're talking to. Maybe just a lesser deal, deity, uh, doesn't quite have it all together, or an evil deity. And the God of the New Testament is the God of love, the God of spirit. And Gnostics were teaching that uh, Jesus came to give us knowledge. That's where the word Gnostic comes from, gnosis, which is Greek for knowledge. Uh, Jesus comes to give us knowledge so that we can escape this material world and go to some other place, heaven, whatever you want to call it. And Christians who were struggling with bringing together these, the concepts of scripture from, from the Old Testament and the New knew in their heart of hearts that, that what the Gnostics were teaching was wrong. That Jesus, when he talked about his father, he was talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The, the God of the Old Testament. And so there can only be one God. And the, the idea of God creating everything begins with this, that God creates everything and he creates it out of nothing. Relate, and remember, related to Greek philosophical religion and it was also part of, of elements of Gnosticism was that the ma material stuff is eternal. It was always there. And God as a creator is more of an architect who organizes the, the material stuff and does something with it. And the Christian thinkers at the time in the second century were saying that can't be. If God is the creator, he must create everything. He doesn't need stuff to use. The Old Testament says God said let there be light. And there was light. The, the, the creation story in Genesis doesn't say, and God took photon particles <laughs> and organized them into something, like a star. Of course, it wouldn't have used that language, but you understand my point. So ex nihilo is out of nothing, and it was a very important development uh, in the doctrine of creation that arose out of the Gnostic controversies of the second century. And I had us last week stop and, and think for a moment about the ways in which this, the notion of, of material 
and spiritual continue to get separated, even in our minds as Christians, into two different things, where you know, we casually, without really thinking, giving much thought to it, will uh, think or say to ourselves, you know, I really would like to get away from the world and go be spiritual. And so we know what we mean when we say that. We want to get away from the busyness and blah, blah, blah. But biblically, there is no such distinction between spiritual and material because God created everything. God is the maker of heaven, spiritual, and earth, material. He's the maker of both of them. And creation is good. And so perhaps then maybe a challenge for Christians is to reflect and meditate on the, the spirituality of material things. And parenthetically, that's really the heart and soul of stewardship. A, a theology of stewardship is a theology of, of looking at the stuff that we have and understand that it comes from God and it can be used for God's glory and His purposes. And our job as Christians is to reflect on how we can do that in a way that gives honor and glory to God. So, that is ex nihilo. Let me just emphasize again that as far as those early Christian thinkers were concerned, the, new, the, the Bible, the Bible depicts God as being active and involved in creation. God walks in the garden. God is in the midst of the garden. God creates the world, and then there he is in the midst of it. He's present and active in the world. Okay? Now, the next thing then in the suitcase is transcendence. This also uh, flows out of Gnostic controversies. One of the things that, that seemed to be pretty common in all the sort of various flavors of Gnosticism is the notion that, that God, the, the divine, uh, sends out an emanation of himself into creation so that Creation is part of divinity. And Gnostics would speak about uh, a divine spark, for example, within us. <clears throat> that there is a spark of divinity uh, inside of us. And, and this sounded awful, an awful lot like a kind of pantheism to early Christians. And and to counter that, they insisted on the transcendence of God, which is to say that God, as creator, is not what he creates. He is transcendent over and above it without being totally removed from it either. That's not the point. The point is that God is not what he creates. What he creates is not God. There is no part of God in us. We are made in his image. We can be filled with the spirit, but that's not what Gnostics were saying. Gnostics weren't using that language that we understand, that God, God dwells within us. Paul talks, uh, of course, about human beings, Christians being temples of the Holy Spirit. But even in Judaism, that didn't make the temple God. Okay, it was the dwelling. It was the place where God uh, dwelled. So God is transcendent over 
and above or over and against. He's not part of the world, and the world is not part or secretly him. Let me stop. Questions about that? Yeah? Is what's going on in Judaism at this time, how much of that is part of there? I don't know. We're in, we're in the second century. I, I, well, no, I mean, the, all the rabbinical and the shikina and all, all, all of that. I don't know. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. Okay. Was uh, everyone here when I just uh, talking about apathy earlier? There was a question in the box, and I wanted to make, make sure that one of you that might have put it in the box wasn't here. Okay. Oh, I, that right. I won't go revisit that. Okay. The next thing is that creation is a gift. God creates for no other reason than he wills to create. And this may seem obvious, but the... What's driving this is a need over and against Gnosticism to say that God didn't create because he needed to. God didn't create, or was, nor was he compelled to create. Creation is an act of grace. Creation is a gift. When we confess that God is creator, we're saying something profoundly important about God's character. And we can sum it all up by saying that God, that God is creator is identical with saying that God is love. We could even say that they are synonyms. And as soon as we say that God is love, of course we're saying that God is trinity. But we won't go revisit that. The love of God as creator is further explained by saying that the act of creating is revealed as the one who gives life to others. Uh, theologian John McQuarrie described God as the one who lets others be. That is, God makes room for what he creates. And for all of that to be true, we have to further affirm that there is no outside necessity that compelled God to create. He didn't need to create. He didn't need to create. By that we mean he didn't need to do it to satisfy some sort of inter, inner deficiency uh, in the life of God. Now, eh, I'm not going to go into that. That just confuses things. Dan, uh, Daniel Miglori, uh, every once in a while, falls back in on himself. I'm not going to go there. All right, so God, uh, creation is a gift, and the point there is that it's an act of love and that God had no need or necessity to create. To call God uh, creator, of course, is to say that we, we are creatures. If we are creatures, that means that we're dependent on God. That's what it means to be a creature. To call God creator is to say that we are finite, dependent beings. It is to say that we are well aware that we might not have been. That is, we wouldn't exist. Our very existence and every moment is a gift. The radical dependency that we have on God is part of the understanding of the transcendence of God, the act of creation as a gift of God, and it's to emphasize that we are not necessary. <coughs> Of course, we are wanted. God wants us, okay? But we are not necessary in order to complete him somehow. He is not less if we didn't exist. 
He wants us, but we are not needed. We exist at the pleasure of our Creator. We did not bring ourselves into existence. And we cannot guarantee or our continued existence. And all of this is related, I, uh, I believe, to the idea that salvation itself is an act of grace. We cannot justify ourselves. As creatures, both as creatures and as sinners, we are recipients of God's grace. We are forgiven creatures. These are things that we cannot achieve on our own doing. So it's not by accident that Paul brings together faith in God as creator and faith in God as redeemer. For example, in Romans 4, verse 17, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Creator and redeemer in one thought, right there in Romans 4, 17. Question. Yep. Now, after now that we're post ascension day, yeah. uh, how do you, is there anything you said there? Uh, you know, so we believe now that there's a, there's a human sitting at the right hand of, you know, part of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, but you just said that God doesn't need us, uh, you know, we're, we're not needed, humans aren't needed. So is there anything, is there anything that we can say about that? You know what I'm saying as a human now? Yeah. That I'm like you said. Um, and, and, and that's a concept, honestly, for me that I hadn't ever, I mean, in my 30 year pilgrimage, never really thought much about until recently. Right. Yep. I'm still trying to like, get my head around that. Yeah, me too. Maybe you don't know <laughs> what's going on. Well, I, I'm not sure I see, uh, I, I don't think I see a connection between the incarnation and the ascension. Uh, God taking humanity into his own being uh, as, as him indicating that he needs anything. I, I just don't see that connection. I, I don't necessarily either. It just came into my head. Uh, okay, okay. But it is a, it's a radical concept to be sure, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of what you were saying, but listening to Greg, uh, could one say that God had tried many ways to bring human beings back into <coughs> the fold, the bucket of a better phrase, and what he ultimately did was to become a human being and so the humanness of Jesus that is at the right hand of God is the bringing back of everybody into the oneness that was there at the time of creation in the garden. And, and I, I'm not sure, but I'm not, I, I don't think we need to put too fine a point on you know, our humanness being there as much as Jesus has taken that because he stepped out of the Godhead, became human, goes back to the Godhead, but what he brings with it, which was separated from it, was our humanness. I don't know, I'm just putting that one out off the top of my head. Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> so would you say that Christ is still human? N.T. Wright goes really close to that, and it certainly blew my mind. That, that's why I'm sort of... Sort of yeah, and N.T. Wright is... Uh, I'm trying to remember what book it was. It must have been Surprised by Hope. Yep. That uh, he, he talks, and I don't think he's trying to be metaphorical. Or he's saying that a human being is at the helm, that Jesus is Lord over all creation, is to say that Jesus is Lord over all creation. And uh, when I was in seminary, the, the notion, uh, the ascension, really didn't mean a whole lot more than what Carolyn just said, that our humanness is now part of the Godhead. 
but I don't recall that any of my professors meant that that meant that there was a flesh and blood human being there. But N.T. Wright is absolutely adamant about it, and I don't know how to explain it, but that's just one. Uh, whether I agree with that literally, I'm not sure. I, 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 the concept is really Radical. It blows my mind. I mean, is, isn't it our belief that he was raised bodily? Yes, yes. I mean, it, 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 it follows. It follows. I guess, where I, I guess what I'm saying is that it's a paradox. <laughs> <laughs> it, that how can God be God and be limited that way? Um, how can God be still flesh and blood uh, in that sense? How can God be Trinity, one God in three persons, when now that there is this distinct person who's limited? Yeah. Well, I think the main thing might help is just the idea of the body resurrection. Christ has his heavenly, I mean, his, 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 his new body, which is not what we... That's, that's, that's true. That's a, that's a good point. That the resurrected body was like, but not the same. He could eat. He could, you could touch him. He could talk. Uh, but he came and went. He wasn't always recognizable. But he still bore the marks. Yep. Um, the scripture that says, Jesus said, that when I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Is that related to... Uh, no, I think that the, well, I mean, in the sense that the ascension is the, the doctrine which is telling us where salvation history is headed. Okay, the salvation history, the, the story of God rescuing his people from beginning to end. Where it's headed is the bringing together of heaven and earth. In Jesus, what we see is the uniting of the material and the spiritual together. And T. Wright would say that, N. T. Wright, or, that, that Jesus is perfectly at home in heaven. By which he means that it is not some place that's unmaterial. It's not a place where physical stuff can't exist. It's a different category, perhaps, but it is still stuff. It's still physical. Paul in, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, it's, it's, you have to be really careful about the English translations where Paul talks about spiritual bodies. And we, because we're so influenced by Plato and, and, and Greek philosophical categories, think to ourselves, non-physical body. Spiritual body is not physical. Eh, thank you for playing, wrong. It is physical, but it's a different body. It's, it's a different body, but it's still physical. Paul does not intend for us to segregate that concept. So in that sense, yes, it's a foretaste. It is the signpost pointing into the future uh, to what is going to be true for all of us. Uh, let me. Ju I was not going to read. I was not going to read this, but I'll. I'll read it now since it seems to make sense. Going back to creation as a gift, and whether it could be called necessary to create. Daniel McGlory wrote this. If we hold to the character of God as described, then there's a sense in which creation may be called necessary. If the character of God is triune love, then creation is completely consistent with his character. Creation is not an arbitrary act. In the act of creation, God already manifests the self-communicating, other-affirming, community-forming love that, define God's, that defines God's eternal triune reality. God is eternally disposed to create, to give life, and share life with others. 
the welcome to others that is rooted in the triune life of God spills over, so to speak, in the act of creation. In that sense, it, it's necessary, or I would say, inevitable. Maybe inevitable is the better word than necessary. Creation is inevitable because of the nature and character of God. Okay? Creation is good. The finiteness and limitations of, of life notwithstanding, to declare, as the Bible does, that creation is good, is to say uh, several things. First, as I've, I've hinted, the dualism of material and spiritual needs to be eliminated. It needs to be rejected. And that, that kind of dualism infects all human life. And that's, a, that's the word I would use. The spiritual is good. The physical is evil. The intellect is good. Sex is evil. Masculine is good. Feminine is evil. Hey. Hey. I think you're a bit outnumbered in the past. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, here's a, here's a, how many of you have heard of the Gospel of Thomas? Okay. Well, I've got it if you want to read it. I've got all that stuff in my library. And the, the Gospel of Thomas, for reasons that just uh, exasperate me, I think, uh, come up in Christian conversation, usually in reaction to... Uh, you know, authors like Dan Brown in The Da Vinci Code writing about it. And my sense is that women get the idea that this is a, uh, a, an empowering document for uh, women. And I submit to you that anyone who says that hasn't read it. Because it, the, huh? The Gospel of Thomas? The Gospel of Thomas. First of all, the Gospel of Thomas is not a gospel in the sense that any of us would recognize it. It's just a collection of sayings. There's, there's no like plot to it. It's just whoop. And yeah, you'll see some overlap, uh, overlap to it. And in the end, uh, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, Peter and Jesus are talking about Mary, and Jesus. it ends with Jesus saying that Mary must be made a man well, it doesn't matter which one. But the point is that, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, I think that's who we're talking about, is, needs to be made a man in order to become perfect. Go, go Google it. Go, Google Gospel of Thomas and read it yourself. Okay. What difference? What difference does it make what Mary we're talking about? Whoever the woman is, in order for her to be perfect, she has to become a man. I'm just thinking of our Bible study and if that would be a topic to even bring up to Erica to talk about on Wednesday. <laughs> well, uh, not to give away the farm, but I've already talked to her about it. Oh, so you uh, haven't just raised that yet. Okay, we'll raise it this Wednesday, right? So. Uh, anyway. Well, I mean, think, think about it. In Gnosticism, the goal is gnosis. The goal is to become spiritual. Perfect. Okay, gnosis, spiritual, perfect. And if Jesus is the source of the knowledge necessary to be spiritual, then it must be that in order to be perfect, we have to be male. Yeah, and, and perfect in that sense is also means complete. Right. So it is. Sorry, see? You're incomplete. Yeah. Right. But I'm wondering if because he was had these women with him, this group of women that are constantly brought up, 
with him that he treated like everybody else if he was almost being like, I don't want to say sarcastic because I'm sure that wasn't really. That's revolutionary. But, but like basically saying like, yeah, you know, this is the way the world is. The only way they're going to be perfect because of what everybody else thinks is that they're male. But maybe that wasn't actually what he believed. No, and the key, the key to this is to, is to understand that the Gospels that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are Jewish. Now, that doesn't mean they're all, they don't have any Gentile characteristics, but the, the, the root of the story is rooted in Judaism. And the concept that I'm just describing to you is Gnostic. It is, it is long after Jesus died. It is, has no connection whatsoever to Judaism, and it is not the kind of thing that Jesus, a Jew, would have said. I know you're not a historian, but do you know when about Thomas was written? Well, the, the thinking is, is that Thomas is quite late, perhaps middle of the second century, so we're talking 320, maybe the, the latter part, Excuse me? Second century is 100. I'm sorry, 100. Uh, 150. Yeah, 150 to um, the early part of the third century. Okay. So not as close as the other. No, they were still, they were done. Okay, so he got it wrong. Then. So, well, I mean, you know, most scholars think that the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were written prior to 70 AD, and that's because the material in those Gospels does not indicate that there is an awareness of the destruction of the temple. The, the, the significance of 70 AD is that's when the temple was destroyed by the Romans. And it was cataclysmic. I mean, in, in Jewish apocalyptic terms, that was the end uh, of everything. And the Gospel of John, most scholars put that around 90 to 100. So now we're talking at least another 50 years after that, if not 100 for Thomas. Okay. So the, the synoptics, so don't they have a lot of references to, well, if you don't believe me, go talk to so-and-so. He, you know, is so-and-so's father. So that it would indicate that it was written closer to because the people were still alive. Those ask them about this in person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. Yep. There is that kind of uh, a sense of not necessarily go ask them, but that there are witnesses. And, and the gospel writers are writing in such a way as to say, go check it out. They don't say that. They don't have that language. But like these people are around if you want to ask. There you go. But in Thomas, there isn't really any of that because it's so much later. Well, and it's not that kind of story. It's not a story. It's a collection of sayings. Cherry picked. Cherry, cherry picked is, is a very good way to describe it. And uh, cherry, cherry picked to defend a Gnostic understanding of Christianity. You're looking to show, Thomas, the, the, the collector of that, is looking to show path to secret knowledge, to, to this path of completion or, or perfection outside of the, the, the grubby, smelly, Jewish, incarnate world. And so, so it's, it's, it's just going through all of the, all of the sayings, all the stuff that's, that's out there about Jesus. It's just, okay, here's a place where we have a little bit of secret knowledge that we can elevate ourselves above the rabble here. To, you know, to, yeah. here's, I mean, think, think of it. It's a, it's a natural thing to have happened at, at one level because Christianity is flowing from Judaism, which uh, Chuck has rightly described as incarnational in the sense that creation is good, it's created by the one God, there's none of this separation of the material and the physical, but in the Greek world, that's not the way the world was created. That's not, that's not reality as Greeks understood it. And so as Greeks were converted, it's not really hard to understand how they might really go, wait a minute. And they, when they started learning about uh, reality from a Judeo-Christian point of view, th that some of them would say, no, that can't be right. <laughs> so let's redo this and make it fit the way we know 
the world really is. And that's one of the things that happens with, with the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, there, are, there are other gospel stories. I mean, there, there, there are lots. The idea that, that, oh yeah, there are all these secret gospels out there. Well, they're not, there's nothing secret about them. Uh, it's just that they're not the kind of thing that, that average everyday Christians read because why would Christian teachers necessarily talk about them when the idea is to help people learn about their Christian faith? But yes, I, there are lots of gospels out there. And they're all second century or later. All of them. And read them. And some of them are absolutely, you know, you, you, you read them and you're like, well, no wonder these didn't get widely dispersed and read. You've got stories of, uh, and I can't remember which gospel it is. Uh, killing his playmates, right. Yeah, or, or Jesus, Jesus as a child uh, makes a, a bird out of clay and, and poof, makes it come alive. And then he kills it. And then he makes it come alive. And, uh, and, and it reduces Jesus to a magician. And, and show me where in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, that Jesus is portrayed that way, as being uh, arbitrary about any of this, and being sort of show-offness. Well, look at, look at all this power that I have. Uh, Jesus doesn't work, act that way at all. And the reason he doesn't act that way, it's not just because it doesn't reflect the character of God. It's not Jewish. It's not the Jewish way of understanding the way the rea reality really is. And so when you start, once you understand what I'm describing to you about creation, which is, by the way, Jewish, then you start reading this other stuff and you're like, wait a minute, this, this is something else entirely. So let that, you know, you let that come out in your, your, Bibles, your, your Wednesday Bible study. So all kind of, uh, God creation is good. All kinds of dualism is to be rejected. And I was giving you those kinds of dualistic uh, notions. But to say the creation is good is not to say that it's perfect in some sort of Pollyannish idea. Okay, it's not to say that there isn't something wrong with creation. Certainly there is, and that's the concept of the fall. Now, let me pause for a moment <laughs> and blow your mind a little bit, if I haven't already. Let's just think for a moment about our lives. And creation is good, and the notion of suffering, which is not good. But is it not good? Oh, well, suffering, though, you have to compare the good with. Well, I can, I can, go, I can go better than that. Uh, in, in the cycling world, cycling is a synonym for suffering. <laughs> I, I have a bunch of videos that I uh, uh, use during the off-season on my indoor trainer, and the company's called The Sufferfest. <laughs> And it is. It's, it's their, their videos where it's a, there's all kinds of interval training. And the interval training is about pushing your body to the absolute limit when it's screaming, stop, 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 and keep going as long as you can. Because that's the way the body improves. That's the way your heart rate gets more uh, healthier. Uh, it's the way your body adapts and changes. Um, this is a basic principle in, in, you know, strength training or aerobic training or whatever, is that you have to challenge your body and push it. And then as you do, your body changes to adapt. And I can tell you that the moment you, you stop, it starts going the other way. Because I know every time I go on vacation and go visit my parents who live in Jacksonville, where it's just flat. <laughs> And I'm there for two weeks, and I come back, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm watching my buddy climb that hill and leaving me in the dust. My point is, now I know that a lot of people don't enjoy that kind of exercise, 
I don't know that I would say I enjoy it. I frequently ask myself, why am I doing this? And then I get out and I do it again. And, and so the end for me is that I, I do enjoy it. Um, it wouldn't be the same without it. Is suffering evil? I suppose it depends on what the suffering is about. How can you have, how can you have just a little bit of suffering and not have a lot of suffering, not have the capacity or risk for a lot of suffering? I, I suppose suffering is in a way a tool, not legit, not like a pencil is a tool, but it, it isn't good or evil, it just is. Consider the role that pain plays in the human body. As uh, let me let me just back up and say that leprosy. Uh, the, the difficulty with leprosy is that your your nerves are affected, and you get to a point where you really are not aware anymore of hurting yourself, and you constantly hurt yourself, and infections begin to spread. Uh, uh, on the skin, which is one of the reasons why leprosy does what it does, because those nerves are not functioning correctly, and you're not uh, realizing that you're hurting yourself. So leprosy. How can you? But how can you have uh, the good pain that makes you bro draw your hand away when it touches that hot stove, without having? the excruciating pain that comes from having been burned, third degree burns on your body, and now you're literally being tortured by doctors who are trying to save your life because every fiber in your being is on, every nerve in your being is on fire. Talk about suffering or that which does not kill us makes it stronger, um, which is not good, um, but very widespread. Um, so much of this depends on where you begin with. What power do you have to survive this? What likelihood do you have to survive this? Can you do anything about it? Then cannot cannot cycle. Okay. Um, can you escape the beating if you're in an abusive relationship? I mean, they're, they're, they're suffering and how we work on suffering has so much to do with our privilege and our relative safety. Um, our baseline of safety is, is um, it's a, for me, and it's very risky to talk about it in any general general sense. Is suffering is suffering always bad? Well, you know, if it's an abused child, yes. There's there's no there's no upside to that. There's no right. improvement of character. Right. There's no. There's, but how, but the but you know I just 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 play devil's advocate for a moment. Why can you abuse? How is it even possible to abuse the child? Because of pain. I can, if if there was no pain, how do you abuse a child? If if starving a child doesn't hurt and cause them to suffer, then how is you know how how am I going to abuse the child if nothing I do is actually going to hurt it? What I'm just simply saying is that uh, I, I understand what you're saying, and I agree that abuse, is, abuse can never be tolerated. I, that's not my point. My point is that creation is good, and there is a fine line between the role that pain plays to, to prevent us from hurting ourselves, to help us grow as human beings emotionally and physically and the kind of suffering that has no meaning and purpose at all, other than to inflict uh, agony into another human being. We're gonna stop there, it's five after.